Hey, I'm Dorotya Nishalovsky. I live in Budapest in the wonderful capital of Hungary. We've learned to play the harp for 10 years with my twin sister. Now I'm studying law, but Fanny is still playing the harp. She's studying at the Academy of Music in Krakow, Poland. In our childhood, we heard a lot about Hungarian harpists. For example, Aristide von Würsler, who was the founder of the world-famous New York Harp Ensemble. Not long ago, Fanny took part in a harp competition organized by Eva Jaschler. It turned out that Eva was also founder and member of the New York Harp Ensemble and has played in 60 countries worldwide with them. The group was invited to the White House by Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton and their guests, for example His Highness King of Belgium. In 1985 they played for Pope St. John Paul II at the Vatican in front of tens of thousands of believers. The New York Harp Ensemble is a brainchild of Dr. Aristide von Würzler, who established the group in the summer of 1970. Since that time, the group has been traveling extensively, not only in the United States, but also in Canada, in Latin America, in Europe, the Near, Middle and the Far East. We've done numerous recordings for Golden Crest, Hispavox, Musical Heritage Society. We've played and performed on various radio and television programs. We played in many presidential palaces and also in the White House. Eva was born in Bitom, Poland. In 1969, she got permission to travel beyond the Iron Curtain and participate in a harp competition in the USA. She won a scholarship there and thus her ambitious career has begun. Fonny and I became very excited because we could get to know a real legend. We decided to make a movie showing her wonderful life story. Eva spends her summers in New York and in winter she lives and works in Cheshin, where she organizes the Polish National Harp Contest. Once a tour guide presented this Baroque church behind us to a tourist group, when, seeing Eva, he stopped in the middle of his sentence and suddenly exclaimed, This is Eva Jaschlar, the famous harpist of our town. Let's meet her. Were they musicians? My parents were not musicians. My mother was a professor of psychology. My father was pharmacist, but they both have beautiful voices. My father especially has a wonderful tenor voice. He loved singing, and while he was studying, together with three other guys, they established some singing quartet, and every summer they would go to the spa at the Polish Sea, and they would have room and board and some pocket money. Uh, they enjoyed themselves, they sang, and when I think about my childhood, I hear my father singing while shaving most of the time, but his voice was absolutely wonderful, his repertoire was, was great, so we had a lot of music. I was born in Bytom, which was a town uh, where the belonged to Germany since we had an opera house and school of music and ballet school and it was quite established. So people from Lwów, from, uh, from all those towns that uh, now belong to Ukraine came. I was growing in town that music was very important and in every house there was a piano. So I started playing uh, the piano and only later on uh, I noticed the harp at, at school and I said to myself, it's such a beautiful instrument, why don't I play it? And then during Christmas I was given this mm, a little mm, picture of Saint Sicily playing the, some also stringed instruments, 
So right away, I said to myself, oh, God wants me to play the harp because the harp is at school. Mama, I want to play the harp. Mama says, okay, go to the teacher, say, my name is Eva Yashlar and I would like to play the harp, which I did. I was 12 years old, I started playing the harp because I wanted to be different than all my girlfriends. Everybody played the piano, so I wanted to be different. And this is how it, how it started. Uh, the harp was um, in the School of Music only because it was found on the attic of someone's home. No one, no one knew what it exactly was, but they guessed it is a musical instrument and here we have School of Music, so let's bring it to the School of Music. And again, from this part of Poland that was given to the Soviet Union, there came a teacher of harp who lived in Bytom, and with her, her father, who was repairing harps. Just coincidence. And when I started playing the harp, so I just practiced, and I was very diligent, and I graduated from the high school of music, and then I went to Warsaw. And my mother went with me uh, because the professor wanted to talk to my mother. And she said, when will you buy harp for your daughter? And my mother, being a professor of the university, and my father, who, who had also a good position, my mother said, we both love our daughter very much. We both have two jobs, but we are not going to steal in order to buy our daughter the harp. So I didn't have the harp. I graduated from the Academy of Music in, in, in Warsaw. Very few people had harps. And I left. And I left for the competition that Aristide von Würzler. It was the very first international competition that Aristide von Würzler put together in the United States of America. Uh, and uh, I went there and I got scholarship and I was so happy because I could stay over there one year. And during this year, I had recitals here and there. And when I was putting the money together, I said to myself, oh, I have to stay here a few more years because I will be able to buy my very own first harp. And this is what happened. So when I finally had some money saved and I decided I'm going to buy the harp, so, uh, Aristide von Würzler told me which harp I am supposed to buy because we already had the New York Harp Ensemble and we had to have the same harps, four same harps because then it was easier to tune them and they looked beautifully. So, I knew that I had to go to Chicago and buy this American harp. I went there. The harp then, in 19, I guess, 74, cost $4,000. I had 1,000. I was nobody. I was a little girl from Poland that started making little money to support herself in New York. They said, it's fine. Give us this $1,000. And the 3,000 they put for five years or six years, and every month I was paying them. And it was wonderful. Wow. Now they don't do things like that. Yeah. You just have to have the full amount or yeah. you don't get the heart. Yeah. So this is... I. Remember it with great fondness and, and very happy I am about that. Maybe they wanted to help Polish girl and in the factory in Chicago, my harp was done by Mr. Wojcik, Polish, another harp, Mr. Matza, and I was shown the factory by uh, Walter Krasicki. So I felt that almost I was buying Polish harp. <laughs> We were not living in a free country. Everybody that wished me well, my family and my close friends, they knew that I would try to stay uh, in the United States and learn mm -hmm. and stay at least one or two years on scholarship because had I come back right away, they would think that I don't have <laughs> something wrong with my head, right? Nobody goes back without learning something and bringing at least some uh, experience uh, back. Mm -hmm. But the moment Poland became free, and the first president of Poland, Lech Wałęsa, was inviting, asking people, Polish people living around the world, to come back, we need you. Mm -hmm. I took him seriously. I took my daughter, I took my harp, and I came back. I believe that I am true. Uh, I, I do love my country, yeah. and, and, and I am true about it. Not like some people who just yeah. talk about it, yeah. but their lives yeah, say differently. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's I promised someone in Polish Artists Agency that I will come back. 
It took me 23 years, but I did come back. Polish ministry paid for my plane ticket from Warsaw to Amsterdam. And from Amsterdam to New York and back, uh, Professor von Fürstler arranged tickets for all of us that came from behind the Iron Curtain because they were girls from Czechoslovakia, from Hungary, from uh, Romania, from Bulgaria. We were quite a lot, and from Poland. My ticket got lost. Oh. This ticket from Amsterdam, New York, got lost. So I would go to KLM every morning for one week with my suitcase. Did my um, ticket come? No, it didn't come. But may Finally, this guy in KLM got so bored with me that he just gave me the ticket really? that was never paid. It was difficult because I couldn't take more than $5 with me. Polish ministry gave me money for these two weeks that I had to then, uh, whatever I did not spend, I had to give back and I did, did give back. But we are sitting in cafe, muse museum, which is a beautiful cafe place in a palace. And this place was just stables for the horses. And in 2003, I believe, or some around that time, it was recreated and uh, this has a very good acoustics. So as I teach in two schools, in Bielsko Biała and in uh, Czech Cieszyn, two times a year, my uh, students, together with some other uh, students playing different instruments and myself, we play right here in January. It's called Vnowy um, Rok's Harfon, which means that we are entering New Year with the harp. And then in June, Vive les Vacances, uh, that we are happy that vacation is uh, beginning. So it's been a tradition like that for the past maybe 12 years that we are here. Eva, Monica, Yeyud, Barbara, and Aristide, who you will meet in a moment, are the New York Harp Ensemble. They and their four harps filled Aristide's living room as they practiced for a Saturday concert at Alice Tully Hall. The rehearsals of the New York Harp Ensemble uh, took place at the apartment of the von Würzlers in <coughs> Manhattan, in New York. At the beginning, uh, the Würzlers ha had only one harp each. Uh, so there were two harps and four harpists. Mm, so uh, I bought my harp sort of early in our careers, but uh, four years after the harp ensemble was uh, founded. So, but we still, we had to borrow um, two additional harps in order to, to practice, and some of us always would bring the harp to the uh, apartment. Only later on, the Wurzlers had uh, four harps of their own, and, and it was easier. Uh, in my, when I was uh, playing with the New York Harp Ensemble, I played with the group 17 years. And in, in those 17 years, there were 14 girls. Uh, that played in the quartet um, because uh, the girls would either marry or move or have other ideas for their lives. So they would leave the quartet and would go on, on their own ways. That's why the rehearsals were for us, for Barbara and myself, who stayed uh, with um, von Würzler from the beginning. It was difficult because every time a new girl came, we would have to rehearse the, the pieces again with them instead of learning new pieces, especially that there were composers that were writing for us. There were composers from Italy, from Hungary, from Turkey, from Poland, uh, that would write for the New York Harp Ensemble. So we had things to do and Würzler would make arrangements for us. So it was sort of tedious work 
uh, that we had to um, go back to the pieces that we already knew, but this is how it was. During the rehearsals, there were no hardships. We just learned our, our parts earlier, where maybe the hardship was that when we were given a new piece, the new piece was either composed or arranged by von Würzler, he would make a score. And then each of us would have to come to, to his place with the um, empty sheets of music and we would copy, hand copy, our own parts. So each one played from the copy that, that we made. This was sort of uh, difficult because now in the era that you have, um, you can make a photograph of the part uh, or, or you Xerox copy, it is so much easier. So it was uh, sort of difficult, but uh, we took it as life. Well, if we wanted to play, we had to have music. As far as we've been able to find out, there are only two harp quartets in the world. One of them is in the Soviet Union, and the other one is here in the Today Show studio. It is the New York Harp Ensemble, and they're here today with us this morning. Four musicians who make up the quartet, three are Polish, one is Korean, and I am going to do my best to pronounce their names flawlessly. You have an effect like a, like a frog? Yes, of course. You said between the strings we put uh, the tuning key and uh, we put to the sounding, but it's very interesting effects, of course. Do men ever play the harp? Why do we always associate a harp with women? But, uh, if you know me a little bit better, you know I like to work with ladies. <laughs> of <course. laughs> It was not a friendship, it was, oh, well, we respected one another and when finally things happened that I couldn't take anymore, I just left the New York Harp Ensemble. So it was a um, working relationship and uh, professor-student relationship, but it was, it was nice. I mean, we had a lot of hilarious times together because um, we traveled so much and we were together 24 hours a day. So we had to like one another, otherwise we would not be able to work together. Aristide was my teacher and Barbara was my, my friend. And then when I uh, gave birth to my only child, my daughter, Barbara uh, was her gut mother. Yeah, so we really had a very meaningful relationship. I remember a couple of things, for instance, we were Maybe it was Iran, maybe it was Turkey, uh, but it was probably Iran, uh, where uh, we went for a walk. So uh, von Wurzler and the New York Harp Ensemble, meaning for, for girls. And there was this uh, guy um, sitting in a little bench and he just looked at the Wurzler uh, at him, at Aristide, and he looked at us and then he started talking to him. So you have four wives, or oh, you must be very rich, you know, because I have three wives, but I am about to buy my next one. I only have one cow and I need to have two cows because she's rather expensive. And um, he asks, so how do you manage your four, four wives? And Aristide says, well, you know, it is very difficult because my four ladies like to go into five different directions. And then he asks, and how do you manage your wives? Uh, and he said, oh, they are fine. I mean, one is responsible for taking care of the children. The other one is responsible for, for cleaning and doing the laundry. And the third one is just doing the um, cooking. So what will the fourth one do? And she'll be the youngest one. So I have different plans for her. And then I remember one time, it was in China. We were in um, um, Beijing, invited to dinner. And it was, of course, Beijing duck, which is extremely popular around the world. Uh, so we had nothing but duck in all kinds of versions. So first came the soup. In Big Turin, there was the soup. And there were tongues of the duck floating over there. And the host would say, look at how many ducks had to be killed in order to make the soup for you. It was like, I don't know, 100. 
uh, we were all trying to be uh, impressed by that. And then, <clears throat> uh, for some reason, I was chosen and given the head of the duck, which was just the head, split in half, butterfly ways, so with the eyes still over there, and I looked at it and I went, oop, like this, and my, I made the biggest faux pas because I was supposed to be happy and I don't know if I was supposed to start eating the, the ice or what not. It was the most delicious part of the duck and I didn't like it so. Here we are in Italy. Uh, we arrived to Italy on Leonardo da Vinci ship that, was, um, that started the trip in New York, then Boston, then um, Palma de Mallorca, Lisbon, probably first Lisbon, and finally Genoa. Uh, and then we had many concerts in Italy, and then we still needed money to buy our tickets, plane tickets, back home to New York. But Aristid said that we have to take care of the harps and stay a little bit longer because we needed still more money, and he is flying back to New York because he has to arrange additional concerts for us. So he just left us over there, flew to New York. Was it funny? I don't know, maybe now it is. I learned from, for instance, from one girl. She was half um, Chinese and half Italian, who played in our group for some time, maybe two years, and then she quit. And when I was about to quit the New York Harp Ensemble because of my daughter and I needed um, doing something else and I couldn't travel so much anymore. So I asked her, how do I go about uh, looking for a job? And she said, don't look for a job, create your own. And this is uh, an idea that I brought from the United States home and I, when I came back to Poland, I did create my own working places. And now we are standing in the castle of uh, Habsburgs with the greenhouse, which is an addition to, to the main building, in which uh, Liszt Ferenc played. Uh, so this is very famous for that. And the very street, this little tiny alley here, it was uh, put together a few years ago and it's called the Street of the Women of Cieszyn. So since I was also noticed by the Czechian uh, population as someone who is doing something for, uh, for the town and for um, a dissemination of culture in, in Czechian, so I think it's quite appropriate that we are uh, talking, standing in this uh, little street of Czechian women. Fun, education, troubles. My life charmed. I had a wonderful childhood, even though it was in Poland that was not free. I had a wonderful time in uh, the United States of America because I traveled the world. I am fulfilled as a person. I am fulfilled as a woman. And uh, I am happy that I could come back to Poland and share with Polish people what I gathered and collected and experienced throughout the years that I was away from Poland. I'm a very lucky person. When I uh, decided to stay in the United States of America, when I went there for the international harp competition in Hartford. <clears throat> I knew that I am not going to go back to Poland as long as it is under communist regime. But the moment uh, the Iron Wall uh, disappeared and Poland uh, became a free country again, I had no excuse to stay in the United States. And uh, first I worked in the <clears throat> college of teachers of foreign languages. I taught drama activities when I was teaching English through songs and games. Um, and I would um, pretend that I am taking my students to Broadway because we listened to Les Miserables or Chicago 
or then I would tell them, and today I'm taking you to the opera, and we were listening to Porgy and Bess, or that I'm taking you to the Philharmonic Hall when we were listening to uh, Peter and uh, the Wolf uh, by, by Prokofiev. So this is how they learned uh, the instruments and how they learned uh, to follow the story and how they learned uh, English. And at the beginning, I thought that I uh, don't want to uh, teach the harp because what work will they find when they graduate? Uh, but then my brother's son uh, started, uh, he put together a group called uh, Grupa Mozarta, which is the Mozart's uh, group. They are all um, excellently educated uh, virtuoso musicians. This is a regular string quartet. And they play um, um, pieces that combine classical music with music from the movies, with uh, folk music, and they have really fun on, on, on stage. And I said to myself that if I teach my uh, pupils well, that they will have theory, that they will have um, all the necessary skills to be good musicians, they will make it, that they will find their own way, that they will find their own path, whatever. They just have to be really very well prepared. And I start, started uh, teaching privately, and after two years we were looking for a school for my first uh, pupil. And it was either in Cieszyn or in Bielsko Biała. And since in Bielsko Biała there was a school that was combining music school with a general school, public school, and this is similar to, to what I graduated from in, in Bytom. So I decided that I'm going to go to the director over there and see what he says. So I went to the director of the school. I told him who I am. I told him that I came, came back from the uh, United States and that I would like to share my experience with, with young people and I would like to teach in his school. Uh, and I had only one student. So we had concert for the, for the school. They could listen to me, they could listen to my little girl. And I started teaching over there. And the next, day, next year I had uh, two students because a little one came for the, to the first grade. She was seven years old. And then slowly but surely I built a very good uh, harp class in uh, Bielsko Biała. Um, and a little bit later, I also opened a harp class in Czeski Cieszyn, because I married a Polish uh, gentleman who, who had a Czech uh, passport living on the other side of Olza River, which means in Czech Republic. So I started uh, teaching over there, and in 2003 I put together a um, Polish harp society, which I did copying the American harp society. And every four months, um, we are um, putting out the bulletin of Polish Harp Society. And our main goal of the society is to help young musicians on their way to become professionals. So we are giving money for scholarships, for um, studying, for um, taking master classes abroad, for going to competitions abroad, or for uh, attending World Harp Congresses when they play. Uh, we we uh, sponsor their trip or just share in their um, expenses. And also every two years we do um, international, by now international harp competition of duos with the harp that I learned is the only one of this, uh, of this kind. And I decided that Cieszyn is the center of Europe because from Cieszyn you have 300 something kilometers to Prague, to Warsaw, to Vienna, to Budapest, to Bratislava. So I just wanted to be with my parents and I thought that you can live anywhere and make your life anywhere as long as you have an idea and you are well prepared to do your job well and you are willing to take chances, to take challenges, to meet challenges and just work hard. When I uh, married my, my husband, um, he still had to uh, live in Prague where he was working all his grown-up 
uh, years. He, he lived in Prague. Uh, so um, I went with my daughter. Uh, we joined him in Prague. And I thought that for the first time in my life, I will be just uh, wife and mother. But the moment uh, my harpist friends, like Dagmar Platilova, who, were, who played with us in the New York Harp Ensemble, when she learned that I'm in Prague, right away I had a telephone call that I am needed in the uh, Statny Opera Praha, which is the state opera, because one harpist was already at home with very little child, and the other harpist was just about to give birth to her child, so uh, I was needed. And for two years I worked in Prague at the opera house. <laughs> So, um, variations. Yes, Louis yes. Spohr. Um, so, he lived in which era? In era. Um, when, when did he live, live? In the 19th century. Yeah, in the 19th century. His wife was a harpist. They, he was a violin player and an excellent, uh, uh, excellent composer. And they traveled together. And it was just wonderful, right? Uh, this variation, this piece, Je suis encore dans mon printemps, was a piece that, obligatory piece, in the competition in 1969, the competition for which I went to Hartford. And this is how my um, career really started. And Professor von Wurzler gave me scholarship, and it made me stay in the United States. And then we put together the New York Harp Ensemble. This piece is technically rather challenging, only because, you see, um, the wife of Spohr, what was Dorette, Dorette Spohr, um, was playing on a small harp, on a smaller harp, and I think maybe it was easy, but for you, tam, 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 tiram, pam, param, pam, param, pam, I believe that you will just have to, you know, make sure that your muscles remember the jumps, you won't have time to look over there, just the muscles will know that this is the fourth, this is the fifth, this is the sixth, how you'll be jumping. But play it from the beginning. I will remember my good days of many, many years <laughs> ago, and I had to practice it when I went to Hartford. pieces because there was no repertoire for four harps. When we began, there was Andre Gretry dance the femme, that was for three harps. So the fourth harp was doing something I don't remember. Von Fürstler did the, the fourth part. Probably he took something from the first harp, from the second and third, and he made it into a fourth harp. We took pieces that were, that were written for two harps. Uh, for instance, Chedelov did um, you know, this partita, he did it for two harps, so we played it on four harps, and it was a, we loved it, and it was very well played by us. Then von Wurster took Vivaldi's Concerto D Major, and he made it into four harps. And we didn't have repertoire, so once we started uh, traveling, there were composers who even without being asked to compose something for us, they wanted to compose something for us because we were a different um, chamber group. Uh, they liked what they heard and they wanted us to perform their pieces. So we had two composers, Kitty and Montori from Italy, that were writing for us. Uh, Ligeti uh, wrote something for us. Turkish composer Adnan Saigun wrote a beautiful piece for us. Then we commissioned from uh, Alan Hovannes and I love this piece, Island of the Mysterious Bells. Then we asked uh, the permission of Leonard Bernstein if we could do one of his short pieces, if we could do it for four harps, and he said yes. We even did Stockhausen's Zodiac for four harps. Yes, 
Polish composer uh, wrote for four harps and he was so happy that finally because he used the 12th tone technique. And of course for one harp it was prohibitively difficult, but having four harps he could do it. So yes, they were composers that were writing especially and expressly for the New York Harp Ensemble. The Chinese composer who wrote for us when we went to China in 1981, um, Barbara uh, von Wurster, she got very much interested in Gu Qin in Chinese koto, and um, she purchased one. And then next year, when we came back, there was a piece for us for, for four harps and Gu Qin. So you see, we were really inspiring composers from, from various countries. Yep. The piece we are going to play for you, it's called Fishing Song on the East Sea, and it was written and dedicated to Barbara by a Chinese composer, Chang Yan. harp makers I know about. It's Lion and Healy, Salvi and, and Kamak. And they all do wonderful stuff. They compete because they are all good. I have uh, an American harp because I lived in the United States of America and I, this is what I could buy over there. Mm -hmm. So this is what I play. But my students purchase harps from different companies, but always one of the three that I mentioned. For me, what is important is the, the tone. But I also know that it depends on the, on the player. Every player puts his soul into the instrument and then the, the instrument becomes mellow if you want it to have this sound. But this is what I, I look for, this mellow sound. Um, and of course I look at how the pedals work, if they are not too hard. But, but also knowing how the harp is built, sometimes the pedals don't go all the way down, but I know that the, the reason is that the rod is a little bit too short and you can unscrew it a little bit and, and then it will be perfect and I'm happy with them. Because I believe that uh, the composer that is a very genius of all times is Johann Sebastian Bach, and what did he write for the harp? Nothing. His son wrote the sonata, which is wonderful. Mm. Well, I uh, like to play uh, virtuoso harpist composers uh, who knew their instrument and they knew how to use it. Uh, they understood the beauty of the harp, the limitations of the harp and they were expanding the possibilities of the harp. Like, for instance, I love uh, Hindemith Sonata. Oh, I think it is a wonderful um, piece of music. There are some classical composers who knew how to write for the harp very much, and their sonatas, uh, Dusik and Krumholz and Petrini, and they are all Dizzi. They are all wonderful. I don't think I have just like one composer that I like. I appreciate Salcedo. I appreciate what he did. I, I always loved his scintillation because it was also obligatory for the competition in Hartford. And I think it's a wonderful piece of music and it's very rarely played. I like, I like Tournier. But I listen to all kinds of music and, and I love uh, Shostakovich and I love Rachmaninoff and I love uh, Prokofiev. And, as uh, far as the contemporary pieces for the harp, 
Mm, I like what Marta Ptaszyńska wrote. She wrote these six bagatelles. I think that they are very cute and very nice. I believe that any piece that uh, you uh, play well and you give the um, the feeling of the era, of the time it was written in, and you just transpose the listeners into that era, um, it's wonderful. Like Fanny just played um, Spohr's uh, variations. It's a very beautiful and demanding piece of music. Nino Rota was, was a compo is a composer, and he, he wrote um, so many great pieces for the harp. His prayer and his sonatina, very beautiful to play on the harp. Mm. So I don't think I have just one composer that I would play more often than different ones. to the United States and I showed my diploma, my master's uh, diploma. I was told that because I studied uh, the harp only four years, this is how long it took to become a master of art uh, in harp uh, in Warsaw, I was told that this is only good as bachelor degree. I studied uh, for my master's degree in uh, New York, at the New York uh, University. It took me two years because I had to collect 128 points, which was, which was wonderful. We traveled and uh, in the meantime I was studying, I was taking the courses, I, would take, I was taking tests and exams. So two years <coughs> wasn't much. And uh, after some time I decided this is not enough, that I would like to get my PhD. So I started uh, studying for that degree, which took me another two years, because I needed, again, 128 points. For my master's degree, the dissertation, or the thesis, was titled uh, Annotated Bibliography of the History of the Harp. So I just read as many books on the history of art as there were in New York. I was going to the public library, but the best library for me was at the Lincoln Center. This is where you have Metropolitan Opera. This is where you have New York Philharmonic, where you have uh, Juilliard School, when you have uh, the building for ballet. And they have there the library for the performing arts. And this is where I studied many, many hours. And first you had to do one recital, and like for masters, two recitals. But the second recital for PhD was combined with a lecture, which was a little bit um, difficult because uh, I had to do it in, in foreign language, and here I had to talk, and then I had to play. But it was challenging, and I liked that. My problem was that the title of my, of my dissertation was a contribution of virtuoso of harpist composers to the growth of harp literature. When I started doing the research, I found 44 names. My proposal, dissertation proposal, was like 90 pages long, and the bibliography had five pages of uh, bibliography. And at that very point, uh, my daughter was born. Well, I taught, uh, but I also had all kinds of other um, chamber groups. I played uh, with Barbara, we had Warsaw Harp Duo, then I played with Marjorie Fitz, we had the New York Harp Duo, then I was the director, music director of the Polish uh, American Cultural Association, uh, and I had Slavic um, Slavic ensemble, chamber group that uh, we had the violin, cello, and the harp. And for many many years uh, we played in the greater New York area. Then I also living in New York. I also played with different. Uh, orchestras and, uh, and smaller groups. Well, I just love America. 
I, I was extremely happy when I became an American citizen only because I could, I could travel. The whole world suddenly became open to me. And, um, well, I have a lot of friends. As I mentioned, Marjorie Fitz, uh, Park Stickney, also played with the New York Harp Ensemble. Um, I had friends in the New York Philharmonic. Uh, I was friends with, with other harpists. Mm -hmm. They might not be known here, but mostly in the New York area. I am friends with um, Carol McLaughlin, who is the teacher of Park Stickney. Um, well, I'm friends with Samuel, um, uh, the guy that, that repairs uh, harps, Milligan, Sam Milligan. Well, I'm great friends with Ursula Kwaśnicka whom I've known ever since we were uh, in the same school, who lives in New York State. Um, a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. And did you believe that the um, Iron Curtain would fall and you could come back in to Never Poland? dreamt about it, never. It was maybe a, a thought, a wishful thinking all the time, uh, living in my, in my mind, in my soul. But I don't think I ever really wished, because it seemed so far-fetched. So when finally we did become free, it was like blessing from, from heaven. I am extremely happy. It's good to hear. Yeah, family above all. I don't think so. I think we can sleep soundly and not worry uh, about that because no computer has the soul. I was asked once, I did concerts for, for school children and before the harp they had the violin and the little girls learned that violin has this piece inside this uh, sounding box that is called the soul. And uh, after I finished playing, two little girls came to me and they asked me, does the harp also have the soul? And I answered, yes, that's the soul of the musician. So there are no uh, machines that can feel like we do. And there are not two performers that we play the same way because they will not feel the music the same way. And that's why it's so fascinating to listen to different musicians, how they interpret uh, same pieces in a little bit different way because of what they have inside. Maybe it's not very many of us who love classical music, who feel classical music, who, who have the need for listening and, and making uh, music but we will always be appreciated, I'm, I'm sure. So when you are a young musician, you cannot make mistakes. You just have to learn how, how not to have a stage fright. If you are not afraid of going to the stage and playing your soul to uh, the audience, if you know that you practiced enough that you know the pieces enough. If you know that your technique is up to the program that you've chosen, I don't think you have nothing to fear, but no, mistakes, uh, you cannot, you cannot make mistakes. You know, great, really great musicians, towards the end of their careers, they would make mistakes and they would be forgiven because people remember them from earlier years that they were immaculate. 
the classical music? Well, it went through all kinds of stages. We had uh, this 12-tone music, aleatoric music. We had all kinds of um, techniques that composers were, um, were experimenting in. But, but music will survive because it is a part of us. We have rhythm in our bodies. We have music around us in nature, if you only listen to nature. That, so music is surrounding us, music is in the universe. Cosmos is full of music. And some of us uh, are more open to hearing what the outside uh, has to tell us. Music will, will always be with us. And I don't think it's, it's going in the wrong direction. It has to go through all kinds of turns, but we are, we are going to, to have music all, all the time with us.